continuing quest for quantitative image analysis in medicine. And the most important word is quantitative. Julia gave you a talk just a few minutes ago in which she told you about medical image analysis and she told you about computer vision. And she said that somehow they were the two sides of one coin and I don't agree. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by talking a little bit about... Um, uh, hang on, which one? Oh, that one, I guess. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about medical imaging and computer vision to give you my perspective on that. And then I'm going to move into talking about breast cancer because that is, in fact, my driver of what started. And then um, the first e example of that is going to be quantitative. It's going to tell you why we need to do quantitative analysis. And from there, I'm going to move into measuring therapy response because it used to be the case that we cared mostly about diagnosis but that's no longer the case. We're now interested in looking at therapy throughout the lifetime course of a disease, measuring how people respond to therapy, measuring how a disease progresses. And then I'm going to ask, what is it that cures cancer? And I'm going to show you that there are some, a lot of unsolved problems, and I'm going to, re, going to tell you a little story about melanoma, which, of course, several of you are going to work on quite hard this week by going and lying out in the sun, and then from that, I'm going to talk a little bit about angiogenesis, and I'm going to finish with a cautionary tale. Although we're interested in quantitative, numbers are not always what we need. We need to ask, are those numbers relevant? And I'm going to tell you about the shape and size of liver tumors. So, the first thing I want to drive into is that medical image analysis is not simply applying, clinic, uh, medical, uh, applying computer vision to clinical data. They're not the same thing. It's not just a question of changing the data sources. And the reason is that medical image analysis addresses a specific medical problem, and that means that we have to work with clinicians. We have to understand what clinicians need. We have to understand what clinicians use. And then finally, we have to understand the fundamental roles of medicine because medicine is bloody hard. It's much harder than computer vision. Okay, so working with clinicians, well, doctors specify the problem. They know what they want. And the first thing that you guys really need to understand is that to a first approximation, doctors are unimpressed by mathematics and algorithm details. In fact, to a first approximation and rounding down, they don't give a shit, right? <laughs> the second thing is doctors are impressed they're impressed by results that enable them to do their job better. So, for example, here you can see a speculated lesion in a breast, which in fact a doctor missed, but one of the programs I'm going to tell you about actually discovered and pointed out to the doctor. It makes a hell of a difference. Now, that feels on the face of it to be straightforward, but please understand that when you work with clinicians, it's a very simple relationship. It's like dating a beautiful girl, or a bloke, or whichever, you, you all have your preferences, um, that you build confidence slowly in a relationship, but it can drop like that. So I had a PhD student who was working on breast MRI, and he proudly, in looking at contrast agent, wanted to show the clinician where the contrast agent was most rapidly taken up. And the algorithm confidently pointed at the heart, suggesting that that might be cancer. No, that's not the breast. You shouldn't do that. And you see the doctor's confidence in that program. It took us three months slowly building up confidence again to get over that. Okay? So that's a really important lesson. So what do clinicians need? Well, first and foremost, they need to understand things like focal enhancement of fluorodextic glucose in the liver. Now, that's actually not straightforward because actually the liver processes sugar in a very complex way. But they need tools that fundamentally they can trust and provide the information that they need. Second of all, they need numbers. So here are a pair of mammograms, a right and left breast. And down here, if you could see it, it says the volume of fibroglandular tissue, and it gives it in cubic centimeters. Down here, it tells you in milligray 
the amount of dose of x-rays that went to that particular breast. Here is the pressure in kilopascals that were applied between the, compre the compression plates and so forth. Those are the numbers that doctors need and I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. And finally, if you're planning surgery, uh, just to orient you, uh, this is your, well it's not yours, but this is a butt, this is a tumour, this is the mesorectum around it, there's the bladder, and that gap between the, the, the nearest affected part of the mesorectum, at the edge of the mesorectum, that gap is what determines whether surgery is possible or whether you have to send somebody simply for uh, palliative care. That's known as the mesorectal resection margin. It has to be at least one millimeter. Now remember that if you're dealing with a response to therapy and you've got an error in a measurement of MI, suppose that you've got some measurement MI and the error is EI, and you're looking at the difference from time now to time six months from now, the error in that measurement is the sum. So errors simply sum. That means that you've got to get errors as low as you possibly can. Again, a point I'm going to come back to a little later. So those are just some uh, things to start with. And then finally, image quality. Actually, even, even crap things like uh, iPhones have got a camera in these days. Um, but, you know, uh, if you look at an axial view of the liver here, it's a pretty reasonable image. On the other hand, if you look at the coronal view, you can see it's very, very blocky. And they've got these, all of these medical images tend to have very poor signal to relate noise to noise ratio compared with uh, cameras. They're also subject to certain numbers of artifacts. So, for example, in MRI, we quite often have, because of the receptor, MR, uh, the receptor RF coil, you'll have a thing which is popularly known as the bias field. It's just the R... Uh, it's just the B1 in homogeneity. And of course, you've also got partial sampling density to do with partial volume effect, which impacts on volume estimation and segmentation, which means that both interpolation and probability density functions uh, become of fundamental importance. And I'm going to talk about those on Friday. The message I want to give you from this first part of the talk is this. We need to deliver accurate results 24-7. 99.9% .9 of the time, not on the four examples that you would show at Mikai. Okay? You want things that work. Otherwise, you're just playing a game. All right? So that has to work despite the sampling, the massive variations across the normal population. How on earth can we deal with getting that level of performance on images which are much harder than you normally get in computer vision? So far as I'm concerned, there's only one way you can do that, and that's the mobilization of models. And here are typical models that you'll get, you know, the things actually that Julia was telling you about, you know, feature detection, deformable registration, etc., etc. But also we need to model uh, various forms of image analysis. We need to wonder about what is in fact the nature of disease. We have to worry about the biological aspects of cancer in my case and we need to worry about clinical aspects of cancer. These are all things we need to model and in the two lectures I'm giving you I'm going to cover the things which are in red. I'm only going to give you a tiny, tiny sample of what you can do. So now let me switch to talking about cancer because that's my main passion in life. I'm just going to give you the figures for Europe in 2012. Okay, so there were approximately 3.45 million uh, uh, new cancers of, uh, cases of cancer, which approximately, uh, just to give you a sense, is the entire Greater Manchester area uh, every year will be afflicted with, with cancer. And there'll be around 1.75 million, million deaths from cancer. If you look in the UK, which is not atypical, apart from the fact that it doesn't support Europe, um, the UK lifetime risk of getting cancer will be 47% by 2020. Let's understand statistically what that says is half of you, right, half of you will get cancer at some point in your life, right? That's as easy as that, statistically. You're no less likely than anybody else. And in fact, we're now way beyond the law of large numbers, so that's actually a reasonable assertion. By 2020, 38% will survive cancer to die of another cause. 
right? For example, cirrhosis, if you drink too much booze. If you look at female cancers, it's absolutely dominated by breast cancer. Fully one, nearly one third of all cancers amongst women is in breast cancer. Now there's good news. 30 years ago, if a woman was told she had breast cancer, she had a, basically, a 10% chance of living five years. Now, she has a 95% chance of living five years. Five years means that she'll move on, she's effectively cured, okay? On the other hand, if you look at men for prostate cancer, which is the equivalent, 26%, we have no effective diagnosis or cure for prostate cancer. If I could persuade two people in this room to go away and spend the rest of your life working on prostate cancer, you would make a huge service to mankind. So those are the numbers. Now what is cancer? Well, if you go back to the beginning of the 20th century, cancer was considered to be one disease, just like pneumonia or influenza or some such thing like that. You go back, the earliest example of cancer was recorded in 3000 BC. Um, the first uh, operation to cure, to cut out a cancer, was around 3000 BC. Um, but actually, until the, end of the, until the 20, beginning of the 20th century, cancer was one thing. By the time we had begun to get through the molecular biology revolution, uh, we were confidently being told there were a hundred kinds of cancer, right? It, now, if you look at Cancer Research UK, it says there are more than 200 kinds of cancer. What is it telling you? We know bugger all about cancer. We know more than we did before, but we still there's a lot that we do not understand. This is burgeoning, it's exploding how much we, we understand, but we're understanding the challenge. There are over 60 different organs in the body where a cancer can develop, and everyone is made up of several different kinds of cells. Now, the one thing you can say about all cancers, all solid tumors, is they grow on surfaces. They're known as epithelial. And when they migrate from one part of the body to another, they find another surface that was rather like the one they left from. So surface recognition, both biochemically and geometrically, are fundamental problems that we have to address. Okay, now why is it called cancer? And actually we have Hippocrates to blame for that. In 15, uh, 1500 BCE, because he thought that cancers, of which two are shown here, resemble crabs, and, a, and cancer was the, the sign of the crab uh, from astrology. And this down here is an example of what is known as a speculated mass in a mammogram. And again, you can see those te tentacles. These tentacles, by the way, are bits of collagen type 2. And what those collagen type 2 is, they bind. They bind, they hold on tight onto the part of the surface. So that if you go like that, it won't move because it's stuck, rather like a tent with guy ropes that you've tied down. So even in the wind, it won't move. Okay? So, now let me move to breast cancer. And in developed countries, one in eight women now will develop breast cancer at some point in their lives. Um, and the peak incidence is women over the age of 60. Around 60 to 65 is when women are most vulnerable. Um, now that's usually about 10 years post-menopausal, because the, the menopause is typically around 50. It used to be considered that breast cancer was only a disease of the decadent West. That turns out to be total bullshit, right? In developing countries, including all of the BRIC countries, the numbers are rising, and they're rising very fast indeed. So for example, in China, there are already one in 10 women are, uh, are afflicted by breast cancer. Okay, it's a fundamental problem. So there's already half a million cases, and the reasons we now understand are increasing urbanization and changes in lifestyle, changes in diet, changes in stress. Very little of cancer today, very little of cancer today is purely genetic. Very little as we understand it, but that could just be our ignorance. Okay? And all of this is impacting particularly on younger, younger women, but we don't really have ways of detecting tumours in younger women yet. So, 
The movement nowadays is towards what is known as personalized screening, and indeed I have a major European grant with Nico Kassemeyer from Nijmegen on this. So mostly what happens is um, women have a mammogram, and I'll explain why in a second, as the first port of call. There are currently around 74, 75 million mammograms taken per year. Uh, they have to be compared to previous mammograms because of the huge variation from woman to woman. Um, and what you end up with then is a measure of a measure. Remember, quantification. We have a measure of breast density, and that's used as a surrogate of risk. So if a woman has got breasts which are not very dense, then effectively they just go on for waiting for screening for the next two to three years. You might think I'm a little ghoulish, but for the last 29 years, my wife has had a mammogram every two years, and I've kept those mammograms, and I've made a movie by doing deformable registration. So I can watch a movie of the evolution of my wife's breast over that time. You might think that's a really, really weird porno movie, um, but actually, there's a very, very good reason for it, and I'll come on to it in a minute. Okay, so low density, unfortunately she's had low density today, you just wait. If it's high density, then, for a reason I'm going to come on to in a second, we then need to move to the step coins. So we then weigh the evidence scientifically, right, which at the moment means flipping a coin because we don't have a good reason to separate those women who will benefit from breast ultrasound and those women who will benefit from breast MRI. And I'm going to come back and talk about breast MRI in a second. The first port of call then is mammography. Why? It has by a mile the best sensitivity. It doesn't have great specificity, largely because of breast density, but it has the best specificity. And in terms of cost and time, it's the only possibility at the moment. These don't have enough sensitivity, and that takes too much time and costs too much. So right now, that's simply not feasible for screening. So for asymptomatic population screening, that is the only game in town. So why mammography? Well, a woman's breasts, fundamentally until the, until the menopause, have a major function, major functional role, which is to produce milk in order to suckle infants. I realize that for the National Enquirer and for the Sun, that comes as a deep shock, right? But fundamentally, the role of the breast is to produce milk. Milk is fundamentally opaque to x-rays. They absorb it. If you take an image of a young woman, basically, it would just look like a whiteout, completely white. At the menopause, that normally what happens is all of that milk-bearing tissue involutes to fat, and fat is transparent to x-rays. So suddenly you can see tumors, right? Unless involution doesn't work properly. And that's where all the problem with mammography comes from, and that's where, what breast density is. It's a failure of the normal biological process called involution, okay? So that's, that's mammography. Now, what is a mammogram? Well, for those of you who've never seen one, and I guess that might be some of the blokes here, what happens is, uh, this is a machine, there's the x-ray tube, uh, this is a lead screen to stop the radiographer getting completely exposed to too many stray x-rays, this is an upper compression plate which is uh, made of a particular uh, form of plastic, and down here is the sensing device, nowadays a digital detector, and that runs through over to the PAX system in the hospital. And the breast is compressed very tightly to around 130 to 150 newtons. That's that, which is why some women find it quite painful. And of course, what that does is it leads to any number of cartoons, right? Yeah. But women get their own back because if women controlled medicine, then we'd have the manogram, right? So. Uh, so what about breast density? If a woman has a failure of involution, then a mammogram is only effective 48% of the time. It's no better than chance. If, on the other hand, the woman has, does not have dense breasts, 
then in fact it's 98% effective. Okay? That's a hell of a difference. That's a perfect opportunity for stratification between dense and fatty. Okay? Now, unfortunately, 40% of women have dense breasts postmenopausally. That is to say, they have ineffective involution. Now, that actually turns out to be a more significant risk factor than having a brother or a sister or any of the other things that you hear about. It is the single greatest risk factor for a woman having breast cancer. And moreover, cancer recurrence is four times more likely. This is the perfect storm. If a woman has dense breasts, you can't see the tumour, the tumour is more likely to occur, and its phenotype is more likely to be aggressive. This is something where you need to detect that situation and go and take a different kind of image. Okay? So what do we do right now in clinical practice? Well, there's a thing known as BIRADS, which is a result of 20 years of discussion in the American College of Radiology. And what does it say? It says, basically, that you should categorise breasts into the breast is almost entirely fat. Second of all, there are scattered fibroglandular density. Whoops, sorry. Um, I pressed the wrong button. Um, and I love this one. The breast tissue is heterogeneously dense, which could obscure detection of small masses. Notice how perceptual the judgments required are. That's not numbers. We need to replace that kind of perceptual stuff with something which is numbers. Let me give you an analogy. That's Byrad's classification one. That's Byrad's classification two. There are scattered heterogeneous densities, mumble grumble. This is three and that's four. Right? So right now we're asking clinicians to lie down and look at mammograms as if we were looking at the sky and trying to grade it perfectly into one, two, three or four. Okay? Surely we can do better than that. We want numbers. Now, in fact, that's been given urgency recently because in the United States there has been legislation enacted largely because of a whole series of um, advocacy groups such as Are You Dense? And these are various states in which there are statutes now on the legislation which require a doctor to tell that woman her breast density every time she has a mammogram. And indeed now... This month, this month there's been a bill presented to the Senate in the United States which to require breast density reporting to physicians and patients by facilities that perform mammograms and for other purposes. The whole movement is towards getting women to be told their breast density and why not? The only problem is what are clinicians supposed to report? If they've got these perceptual classifications, how the hell do you give a woman number? What are you going to do when somebody comes and sues you because you told her she was Byrad's classification 2 and she gets a tumour? Right? Uh, our dear American cousins have got some wonderful things, but lawyers is not one of them. So what's the problem? Here's two mammograms. Okay? Um, two mammograms that actually look quite different. This one doesn't appear to have a lot of density. This one's got quite a lot of dense breast tissue. Okay? They look quite different. And actually, if you look at these names up here, TLS and BK, they're two of the UK's most experienced radiologists. They were asked to estimate the amount of dense breast tissue within those two mammograms. And one on the left, this, guy, this woman here, reported 25%. It doesn't look like there's very much dense tissue. This woman re recommended 40%. That's a big difference, 25 to 40%. The only problem is, it's the same breast and those two images were taken 10 minutes apart. That's a problem, right? It says that the contents of the breast were confounded by whatever it was that took the image. Right? This one was in fact exposed to x-rays for twice as long as that one was. Now, actually, I play with that. Here are a couple of images that you can take just by changing the f-stop on your camera. Here are two images I took in St. Petersburg, right, in the beautiful Summer Palace, right? Here, I wanted to emphasize the statue. Here, I wanted to try to capture the flow of the water. And I deliberately did that 
by changing settings on my camera. That's exactly what happened on those two mammograms that you just saw. The radiographer chose the settings. So, for example, here, there was a particular tube voltage, which was this, pretty much the same, but here, the exposure time, just like in my St. Petersburg image, was twice as long as that one. Right? So, if I take a point here, the intensity was 1,728, whatever that means, right? versus here, it was 3,401. Beats me. Okay, so the point is that image intensity relates to anatomy in a very complex way, which makes quantitative image analysis very hard. So 20 years ago, I started working to try to figure out if we could actually model this to, to decouple these two things, right? And what we did was we've come up with, so far, four solutions to this problem, the first of which was known as HINT. And it came up with a quantitative analysis, and I tried to give it to a company because I wanted to, women to benefit, and the company said, oh, academics, you know. So um, we thought, uh, well, we want to get this out, so we started a company. And that company has done very well indeed. We've now got our stuff installed in about 2,000 hospitals around the world, right? By the way, that company came up to me and asked me then if they could buy the stuff, and I gave them a two, after a deep reflection, gave them a two-word answer, and the second word was off. So, we also wrote a book on this stuff. So here's a little bit of physics. If you have x-rays with a certain fluence, that's a flow of x-rays, and it goes into a block of material with a characteristic attenuation rate, a linear attenuation mu1, then what will come out is i e to the minus hu. That's known as Beer's law. There's a fundamental observation you have to make from that, namely, if that fluence goes through three blocks of tissue, mu1, then mu2, then mu1, of, of uh, height, H1A, H2, H1B, the fluence is that, and notice you could move that block there, up or down, and it wouldn't make any difference. In the end, mammography is fundamentally projective, right? So you have to do something like computed tomography in order to get 3D, but it's fundamentally, um, it's fundamentally projective. Okay, so can we model that? Well, here's our mammography machine, uh, here's our upper plate, here's our lower plate, and this pink thing is supposed to be the breast. And we've got a fluence of X-ray coming down through the upper plate. We know what the lucite, the plastic, is. We know what the X-ray spectrum is, because that's told us, that's part of the machine. We can read that in the DICOM header. Um, and so, given from the device, we can get an X-ray photon fluorescent model, and I'll show you what it is. In, it just comes out to be this. It says that the energy amount that goes onto the detector is this expression here. Oh my God, it's Monday morning, it's early, how the hell can we make sense of that? Well, actually, this is trivial, right? There's Beer's law, right? That's just what's happening going through these plates. There's the lucite, and that's whatever the, that's whatever the attenuation is, and that's however thick those plates are. That's the stuff that we don't know, right? That's the spectrum, so a whole range of energies, so it's an integral over all of those energies. So that's just a transfer function that takes into account spectrum energy, that's that thing, image gain and so forth. And this stuff down here is very, very straightforward. It's just the tube voltage, which we can read out of the DICOM header, the exposure time we can read out of the DICOM header, and the pixel size we know because we know the, we know the, the detector. In short, we can pretty much know everything. Now, in fact, the original model we had says the following. The literature tells us, and it's probably wrong, the literature tells us you can't distinguish stromal tissue and tumours on the basis of attenuation. So collagen and a tumour are pretty much the same, as far as, as, far as is, is written in the literature. We think that's nonsense, and that's one of the biomarkers I'm working on at the moment. Right? Um, so, if that's the case, then we can only tell two different kinds of tissue, fat and not fat, which we call interesting, because we figured fat wasn't particularly interesting, unless you're on a diet. So, if that's the, separa the separation between the plates, then you've got fat and interesting tissue at each pixel location X. So, our job, our job then, is to find that there. That's the number. So, from our equation, which I just gave you, we measure this, 
We know all that stuff. We know the compression plates. So the only thing we don't know is that. Okay? So, with a little bit of smarts and a patent, you can figure out that that thing is just that there with the appropriate attenuation characteristics, which you can then rewrite from h is equal to h fat plus h int. And hey presto, if you plug in the fact that you know what those attenuation factors are, you can solve for this thing h int. Okay? Now, if you do that, then you start with a mammogram, you take this physics model, and you end up with something which is in fact measured in centimeters, not brightnesses. It's now in centimeters. It's a number. Okay? So, what we can do then is we can produce Birad's 4, but now it's got a percentage of breast density and it's got all the amount of fibroglandular tissue added up over the whole breast. So we've got numbers. Now actually, <coughs> we can get away from a lot of calibration stuff by doing some stuff I did with, Marco, uh, with Nico Kassemeyer in Nijmegen and Martin Niaffi in Toronto. And it turns out that if we know one pixel, which is fat, we can avoid all calibration data and so forth. So what happens from that then is that we end up with breasts here, which are fatty, blue sky, it says one. It says one, just to give you an idea, we've processed over three million mammograms in the past year in over 300 centers around the world. So this stuff works, right? Here's typical, but instead of being the sky analogy, we've now got two, three, and four. Okay? So now, what we can do is, <coughs> we can now have a way of rationally doing stratification. A woman has a mammogram, the, value, the, the doctor will look at it, but before the doctor's looking at it, we can come up with a measurement of the amount of breast density, and then before the woman leaves the clinic, she can be told, Mrs. Jones, our new technology tells you that you have got particularly dense breasts. We recommend that you have an ultrasound before you leave the clinic. And by the way, because you've got Birads 3 or 4, according to our machine, your breast ultrasound measurement will be reimbursed. It won't cost you a penny. Suddenly, there's been an increase, increase in the number of ultrasounds by a factor of 10. All right? And just to give you an end idea, we can produce um, statistical, we've got 74 million mammograms, tells us now we can do some big data analyses. We can begin to take variations in density with patients. Here's an interesting fact. A major clinic in North Carolina who works with us had a range of women, that, uh, but actually our system was telling him that all the women were Birads 1 or Birads 2, that is to say fatty breasts, right? But he was allocating 25% of women to Birads 1, 25 to 2, 25 to 3, and 25 to 4. He was, half the women, he was saying, had dense breasts. On the other hand, we have a target population in Toronto in a particular wealthy middle-class area where women jog and do all kinds of other unnatural things, and basically, did not have dense breasts, but was still getting 25% with Birads 4, 25% Birads 3. Right? So, what we can do now is we can build population norms across the society. And we're now beginning to do a lot of epidemiology work based on the millions of mammograms taken in Europe. So, here's one example for quality control where we have 11 different radiographers who are doing mammograms in a clinic. Down here, we take the number of images, the number of studies, the number of different women, the median age, etc., etc. We take all this kind of stuff, including the pressure applied, the median contact area, compression force, breast thickness. And you look at all of these numbers, and one number leaps off the page. It's this one. This radiographer is not compressing the breasts sufficiently, which means that the glandular dose that's being given is too high. So she's actually doing not a good job for, that, for those women. This system can automatically report back saying, this radiographer, number 11, needs additional training. Right? So I started out doing mathematics to model the formation of a mammogram in order to assign breast density for stratification. But actually, the product that's selling is the one that does quality control in the clinics right, to help make better mammographers. 
But it's the same physics underlying it all. Here's another thing. Women are getting more and more worried about dose because dose adds up over the years. That's why you don't have a mammogram every year. You have one every two years or three years. It's because it sums up. It stays with you. Right? Okay, so x-ray dose is pretty low in mammography. In fact, it's required to be under 3 milligray per year. But there's a problem. If you've got millions of women, 75 million women, having a mammogram every year, and you've only got a tiny, a minimal risk of excessive dose per woman, it still means that you're going to get a likelihood of an X-ray-induced death each year. Right? It's bound to be. As the Scots would say, money a mickle, mach a muckle. Lots and lots of little things make a big thing. Okay? So, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, quality control, requires that the mean glandular dose be under 3 milligray for a specific phantom. I'm not interested in phantoms, I'm interested in women. If you go in to have a mammogram, it's you that we want to understand. Right? And if you've got dense breasts, it's different from not having dense breasts. So we don't want to have a phantom measurement for this. You know, the only time women were ever phantoms for me was when I was trying to chase them when I was a kid. Right. Each manufacturer shows a mean glandular dose for each image, but every manufacturer, whether it's GE, Siemens, Toshiba, Fuji, Philips, Hologic, right, every single one uses a different algorithm to establish, to estimate that dose. The comparison between machines and machines and model to model is almost impossible, right? And the records of accumulated dose are completely suspect. We need to do better than that. So can we calculate it using our physics, right, plus whatever information is in the Daikon? And the answer is, yes, we can. And actually, shh, you're not supposed to know, right? We've just been awarded a prize for the top technology in medical imaging in the world as a result of actually giving person-specific dose estimation all based on that trivial little bit of physics that I showed you at the beginning. Okay? And so now what we can do is we can personalize our dose and we can compare it with manufacturers. Right. Now, eventually, originally I showed you do mammography and you end up with weighing the evidence and having breast MRI or breast ultrasound. Let me tell you a little bit about breast MRI. Breast MRI is always used as contrast agent because here is an MRI of the breasts, but you can see that there's nothing visible, right? You can see there's fat around here, which has got a different T1, there's the heart, right? But there's nothing visible in there. But if you look at this take-up of contrast agent, which is typically a, a chelate of a, an, a, an appropriate lanthanide, typically gadolinium, right? What you can see is a light turn on there, just there. That's a very, very rapid accumulation of contrast agent because of the vascularity around a tumour. A tumour a tumor grows its own blood supply in order to get a disproportionate amount of nutrient. Now, if you look at the en signal enhancement, which is done in all clinics around the world, and you look at the difference between malignant, benign and normal, and fat, which doesn't because it's very poorly vascularised, right? That's typical over time, as you take MRI volumes, you'll get these curves. The most important thing to realize is that it's quite hard to tell the difference between malignant and benign just on the basis of signal enhancement. And the reason for that is that signals are very non-linearly related to what you really care about, which is in fact the concentration of gadolinium, contrast agent. So there's a non-linear model from here to here. But notice, if we could solve that problem, if we could figure out the concentration of gadolinium, it's really worth it because the difference between malignant and benign shoots up. So we get far fewer false positives if you can do that. So how can we do that? I hope by now you're saying, I know what that guy's going to rant on and tell me he's going to tell me we need to do a physics model of the image formation. And if that's what you were going to say, you were dead right, because that's what we've got to do. We've got to figure out how to measure T1. Fortunately, it's trivial 
to measure T1. Not the brightness, but to measure the actual raw underlying value. So this is a typical signal model for gradient echo in MRI. It doesn't matter what it is. These are constants to do with a particular machine. That's the, um, that's the excitation time. That's the T2 star of the particular voxel. That's the flip angle. That's the repetition time, and that's the T1. Right? Now, what does all that stuff mean? Well, actually, these are the two things. These are the relaxation, relaxation constants that we care about for each voxel in an MRI image. That's the stuff that we would most like to know, but we don't. These things here depend on the machine, right? But we don't know them. The only things that we can vary are the flip angle, TE, and TR. In practice, we vary alpha, although other people have done others. In practice, you can vary alpha. Now, why can you do that? Because when you were about 14, you learned a little bit of algebra, and you were able to take that equation there, and you could very simply rearrange it so it looked like that. So what? Well, here, that looks like y equals mx plus c. It ought to be a straight line. So if we now vary alpha, we vary the yi's, we vary these xi's, we don't change that, and we can now figure out that. So by taking a series of different flip angle acquisitions, right, and observing the results, we can estimate this gradient, which is e to the minus tr over t1, but we know tr, so we can estimate t1. Trivial. Well, not quite. Not quite, because when the machine tells you three degrees, it doesn't mean that it really was three degrees. And it doesn't mean it was three degrees over the whole volume. So you have to be a lot cleverer than that. But nevertheless, that in basis is the basic idea by estimating T1. And then, when you've got that, you can then look at what happens when you increase the concentration of gadolinium, which is what we want in order to get those curves. And that's actually straightforward from this stuff. And by the way, I did that for gradient echo. You can do the same thing for spin echo and all the other MR pulses, pulse sequences. That's quite straightforward. I want you to remember this slide. If you only take away two or three slides from this talk, this is one of them. So please stop screwing around with the internet for about 10 seconds, right? Reading your emails and other really important shit, right? This is important. This is two images, pre and post chemotherapy, of a woman at the hospital in Oxford. And here, that bright thing there is the bright light that I showed you before. That's evidence for a tumor. And so the woman was given chemotherapy, make her feel sick, all the hair fall out, and so forth, right? And three months later, that's the MR image. What would you decide if you were a clinician faced with that information? The answer is quite straightforward. There to there, it's half the size. So, give another three months of chemotherapy and maybe we'll get rid of it. Another three months of feeling sick and the hair falling out and so forth, right? Let's give you a different answer. If you do the physics that I just wrote down on those last few slides, that, which is intensities, becomes that, which is contrast agent. So from there to there is the physics we just did. There's a very different story. That is the enhancing ring of the viable tumour. The blue in the middle is the necrotic centre. The cells are already died. Right? It's the same shape as that, but that tells a different story. And three months later, that becomes that. What do you, as a clinician, say now? Mrs. Jones, I'm delighted to tell you you're cured. Right? We'll give you tamoxifen for another five years, but your tumour has responded. That's great news for Mrs. Jones. Here, three months of chemotherapy. Here, cured. You better believe your maths, right? 
You better believe the physics that you just did to come up with that diagnosis. This is not a video game. You're playing with people and you're playing with diagnoses as a result that actually impact on the woman. So please understand that that is quite serious, has implications when you're doing mathematics. All right. Let me move on to another thing now, which is uh, earlier before I talked about modeling therapy. This is work that uh, uh, <coughs> our esteemed uh, Lord and Master, or Lady and Master, uh, Yulia and I did together with uh, Manaf Bushan in Oxford. Um, these are, this is the bladder. This is uh, your butt plus a tumor. There's a tumor in the middle there, if you could see it. This is the mesorectum around here. And most patients get downstaging chemotherapy prior to surgery, but there's 150 patients in Oxford, in our clinic, who have downstaging chemotherapy for colorectal cancer, for rectal cancer every year. And 10% of them, 15, 15 people, right, basically have surgery, but it turns out that having that chemotherapy prior to surgery, they'd already been total responders. The surgery was unnecessary. Despite the fact it's going to cut that out of their butt and it's going to leave them with a stoma for the rest of their lives. Fifteen people. If only we could find the complete responders. Yeah? So that's what we could we figure out who are the most complete responders. So, a mixture of peristaltic motion and various other things. It's one of the images that Julia showed you earlier. You get movement, and of course, if you're trying to draw those curves that I had before that go like that over time, then that moving around, that bobbing around all over the place is a real problem. So, one of the things that we did that's in, uh, um, that was in the uh, 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 Medical Image Analysis Journal recently is you can take this image set and you do two things at the same time. First of all, you are estimating correct for motion, and second of all, you, you, you fit a pharmacokinetic model to the data. Okay, there are various ways you can do this, but that's fundamentally what's going on. You can turn it into mathematics, which is just a straight, which is straightforward uh, expectation maximization uh, uh, optimization. Uh, you can read that if you want, either in Manaf's thesis, or you can do it in the paper that's in the... In, in the Medical Image Analysis Journal, or in MICAI. What does it mount to this? If you do that, that's the data, that's what I just showed you, and that's the motion-corrected data. Now you can begin to fit the curves, okay? And when you fit the curves, then it turns out that if you take the, these intensity curves, then fundamentally, it turns out, because we fitted a pharmacokinetic model, that's the take of a contrast agent, at the time we were doing the registration, it turns out that the, the, the accuracy of the curve, which is this purple one, is better than ground truth. How do we know ground truth? In this particular case, we deliberately introduce random motion to start with as a, as a test. Okay? And notice that compared with sum of squared differences and normalized cross-correlation, we get much, much better results. Does that matter? Well, here's a non-responder, and here's a responder taking normalized cross-correlation. This is before therapy. Uh, and this is, this is a particular pharmacokinetic parameter known as K-trans. I don't want to go into what that is. And that's after therapy. That's a responder. The point is, it's bloody hard to tell the difference between those two, right, on that. If you do what we just did, where you make the pharmacokinetics a part of the registration, then the difference between a non-responder and a responder is significant. And indeed, um, it was... Uh, Julia's suggestion that what we can do is this is without motion correction, this is with motion correction, these are the responder, these are the partial to full responders, these are the non responders, and if you take the Kolmogorov Schmoenev test uh, for before and after, you can clearly, significantly, statistically significantly separate those two groups. To then tell those people to go on and have additional imaging before they go for surgery, just in case they have a total response. Now, let me move into the last but one part of my talk. In the end, I've talked to you about breast cancer, and I've talked to you about mammography, I've talked to you about MRI, but what cures cancer? Right? Well, I can tell you that surgery cures 
around half of cancers. You cure it in the sense that you cut it out. So long as it's localized disease. It won't work for metastatic disease, but if you've got localized disease, it'll cure it. Radiotherapy takes around 40 to 42 percent, leaving chemotherapy, about what all the fuss is made, of somewhere between 11 and 6 percent. So for all of these wonder drugs that you'll find for curing cancer, whether it's Herceptin or Bevacizumab or what have you, actually the impact that they have on the total cure rate for cancer is relatively small. That does not mean that we should not work on chemotherapy agents. Indeed, one of the most exciting things that we now know about cancer is that if you take a chemotherapy agent plus radiotherapy and you combine them, you will have outcomes that are better than either of them separately. Okay? Now, what's the scientific theory that underpins that at the moment? That. We know pr pretty much nothing about how radiotherapy and chemotherapy impact upon the local tumour microenvironment. There's 150 people here, approximately, apart from those who are still sleeping, right? Um, if you wanted to really, really make a mark, understand how radiotherapy and chemotherapy can interact. It is a huge, huge unknown territory at this moment. There are various markers for cancer. There's a whole range of different cancers are many I told you there are over 200 kinds and it's probably more than that. So there are those, for example, uh, which uh, take various uh, kinase receptors. There are various ones down here that take uh, vascular endothelial growth factors. There are any number of aspects of this very, very complex entity known as a tumour. And I'm just going to rely on one of them. I'm going to tell you a little bit about inhibitors of VEGF signalling and come back to image analysis and what we've been doing. First, a story. One of the biggest killers in cancer in the United States is melanoma. It's a skin cancer and there are very many kinds of melanomas, but one of them is in fact chronic myelogenous leukemia. I'm just going to call it uh, a mel uh, melanoma. I'm actually just going to call it melanoma. All right? 40 to 60 percent of patients with melanoma have a mutation of a particular protein which is known as BRAF. RAF is one of the parts of a, a, a chain of a wonderful cascade of a cellular process that goes from the cell boundary with receptors and recognizers down through a series of kinases and proteins and effectively get into the nucleus and sort out things like um, cell uh, survival through opto apoptosis and angiogenesis. A particular drug which I'm going to call VEF Vemorafenib um, is an inhibitor of that particular protein. That's its chemical compound, it's neither here nor there, but this drug inhibits that, so it prevents this overexpression of BRAF, which is known to cause melanoma. Does it work? Well, here's a patient, this is a 38 year old man, and you can see there are many, many skin cancers all over this guy. You don't need an image to tell you that, a photograph will do it. However, if you take a PET image of that guy, you can see just how extensive the cancer is in this guy. That's a particularly horrible photograph, right? Well, what about this drug, Vemorafenib? Three weeks. There to there. Three weeks of treatment with this agent that now looks at what is known as molecular medicine. Brian Drucker, one of the greatest cancer experts in the world, said, this is one of the finest examples I've ever seen of science triumph triumphing over disease. And so it is, except before treatment, 15 weeks of treatment, and 23 weeks of treatment. Why? The tumour figured out 
what Vemarafirab was doing and figured out a way to grow that bypassed RAF. Tumors are agile. Tumors are incredibly agile. It rapidly learns to mutate to accommodate new therapies. This is a very salutary lesson, but it's also not entirely bad news because we can model what's going on. How can we model what's going on? Well, this is just a simple picture of the basement membrane. This is from Weinberg's wonderful book. I'll come back to that. This is a simplified picture of the, the plasma membrane, the basal membrane. And remember, almost all cancers grow on surfaces. Surfaces of structures within the body. Okay. So, it turns out, it turns out the, the, the growth of cancer and the growth of angiogenesis actually exploits one of the most successful processes that we have in biology, which is wound repair. When you cut yourself, you don't just bleed to death, unless it's a particularly massive cut. Right? There's a whole cascade of processes which will stop that bleeding and heal over so you'll never see any, any scar at all. Right? This just gives you an indication of the extraordinary molecular biology dance that goes on once you've had a cut. From our purposes here, you go from the stroma damage to the vasculature, you get, ple you get platelet degranulation, that leads to the recruitment of a whole series of macrophages, that leads you down to a thing called vascular endothelial growth factor, which is overexpressed, which will lead to angiogenesis, and that's what tumours have exploited. Okay? Now, what does it look like? Well, what a tumour does is it grows all of this vasculature to very leaky vessels, and so it moves from normal tissue, which has got this beautiful orderly arrangement of multiple scales, these are typically submicron, down to this, which the tumour has erected. And why is it erected it? It's erected it in order to give itself disproportionate amount of uh, nourishment. It's like in my garden in France, I have a hose pipe and then leading off it tiny little pipes, each of which have got holes in, and when the water's on, it drips, drips, drips. And there are many, many of these things. And so the plant gets a huge amount of water and it will grow appropriately. And that is what that's doing. This inefficient, deliberately inefficient leaky vasculature in order to call it to grow. But we can model what's going on because there's a whole series of imaging angiogenesis. There's a zillion targets. I've just written down seven of them on this slide and I'm only going to look at one of them which is in fact integrins. But just to give you an idea, there are seven biological targets that you can get at in order to figure out what's really going on here. But one of them is integrins. And the one we can look at, in fact, is remember I showed you the extracellular matrix, right? And what we can do is that there's a particular integrin which is known as alpha V beta 3, which mediates the migration of these endothelial cells. I told you about endothelial cells, the things on surfaces, right? So this thing mediates the migration of those cells through the basement membrane, that basal membrane, right, during blood vessel formation. I told you it was like wound repair. Right? So this integral, alpha V, beta 3, is fundamental. What it does, it binds to a bunch of te peptides. And one of those peptides are, contain a particular amino acid sequence, which is always known as RGD. And I've never understood why, because it's arginine, glycine, aspartic acid. Never understood why the hell that is, but it's called RGD. The point is, you can take RGD and you can bind it to a PET positron emitter, right, 18F, and you can see, you can see renal tumours build up, right? Now, we've begun to model that. We've begun to model everything from its basic chemistry through its basic biology through to SPECT and PET images. That whole chain. That involved us working with radiochemists, clinicians, molecular biologists, engineers, uh, Julia and myself, working on this and with young doctors, in particular, a young doctor by the name of Neil Patel. And what we can do is you can begin to model the way in which these vascular endothelial growth factors here are recognized, permeate the cell, and get into these little tyrosine kinase receptors inside the cell boundary, one of which has a downstream effect of angiogenesis. 
And what does that do? You can come up with a very simple cellular pathway model. The cellular pathway model, I showed you some of these before. There's a whole series of these. This is known as the hypoxia inducible factor, um, which in fact is the fact that tumors can grow without oxygen supply. Here's VEGF, here's VEGFR. And here is one of the drugs that people have heard about, bevacizumab. It's sometimes called Avastin. Okay, very, very popular drug. And what it does is it inhibits that. So you can, if you inhibit that, you inhibit angiogenesis, you cut off the tumor's blood supply to start with, okay? But the mechanism by which that happens, and these are the names of other drugs that people have played with, and we've played with that one and that one in our lab, but that's the one that we're mostly playing with. But what you can do is, by doing some radiochemistry and some biology, allied to what we do with, en with the doctors and with, with the engineers, is you can produce this SPECT agent, single photon emission computer tomography, and we can begin to plant xenografted tumors and then fuse that together with CD. And we can begin to model the growth of these tumors. We can make our depth of understanding of tumors that much greater. Okay? And it's not just a question of showing that we can highlight a tumor, because what we have to do, what we have to do is to understand what the biodistribution and immunohistochemistry of this is. Hang on a minute. I started out by talking about physics and mammography, and then about physics and MRI, and now I'm doing chemistry. There are no boundaries. None of this stuff is done by lone individuals, it's done by teams of people working together, right? From many, many disciplines. In our cancer center, we have 14 different departments who work together in solving these problems, addressing these problems. So the point is here, you can look at the percentage take up of this drug for the biodistribution and you can see that it's high in the tumor but basically you know it doesn't get into the spleen and the liver and the and the tail and of the mouse uh, and the muscle and so forth in short you're not going to get unwanted side effects from this drug that's part of doing the imaging study and one of our imaging studies was to correlate by doing registration of this, which is the take-up of Avastin labelled by our drug, with what we see from the vascular endothelial growth factor from a post-operative, uh, from a histology slice, and lining those up so we can get these take-up numbers. Okay? I'm going to finish with a cautionary tale. This talk is about numbers. We need numbers. Stop buggering about by showing me pictures. I'm not interested in pictures. Doctors have pictures. I'm interested in numbers. That's what engineers want. That's what engineers can give, is numbers. This is how tumours are modelled in every clinical centre in the world today. They use what is known as the Response Evaluation Criteria in Solid Tumours, RESIST. And what does it do? It says, and I've quoted exactly from the, I've quoted exactly from the definition of resist. For target lesions, for example, here in the liver, choose up to five lesions, up to two per organ, add up the longest diameters. Longest diameter. Uh, I guess that means it must be a rugby ball or some bloody thing like that, right? American football. Right? Add up the longest diameters of non-nodal lesions add the short axis and then this is the sum of the short this is the sum of the longest diameters the SLD and then what you do is you figure out if that's greater than the threshold all right so a complete responder is the disappearance of extranodal target lesions where all pathological lymph nodes must have decreased to less than 10 millimeters in the short axis really yeah and what about progressive disease? Well, the SLD has increased by at least 20% from the smallest value on study, and it must also demonstrate an absolute increase of at least 5 millimeters. Really? Okay. Whatever you say, boss. Now let me show you reality in liver tumors. That's a liver tumor before we gave chemotherapy. Looks like a sphere. Yeah. Nine months later. Doesn't look like a sphere. 
It looks like a sphere with a bunch of spheres stuck on it. You know, like you took plasticine and you just shoved things, stuck things on one after the other. Right? So, what on earth are these? They're clonal expansions. When a tumour grows, it grows itself up like inflating a soccer ball, and when it gets to a certain size, it thinks, I can't sustain all of that volume because the volume is growing as R cubed. So it starts another little clone. Right? Right? A bit like the British Empire used to be. Right? So we'll start a clone here. Oh, and that's India's getting rather large. We'll set another little clone up here. Right? So you grow clone after clone after clone. That's what we're seeing here. All right? And pre ablation, it's grown even bigger. Some of those have died away, and some of them have got bigger and bigger. In short, these are quite complex. And if you look here, this is radiology. Right? And that's actually what happens when you resect. You, take out the, you chop out the tumour. That's actually the picture. You can see very clearly that's the centre, and you can see these. Can we figure out what order they grew in? Can we understand the dynamic biological processes that led one to grow to another? Can we understand the social history of what happened to that tumour? Right? Well, it's pretty easy, first of all, to build geometry. The geometry is trivial. All we do is we, have a bunch of, we take a bunch of spheres and we do the sphere packing to get the best model. And then we can look by matching which ones grew and which ones shrunk. Right? That's easy. Now, can we do a bit more than that? Well, the answer is yes, we can. There's our 3D model of the tumour, so we can give each one of these, which are our putative clones, we can give them a number as well as a colour, right? And then what you can do is you can do what is known as a ray com com uh, comparative genomic hybridization, CGH. And what that does is it takes around 400,000, which is actually now nearly a million probes of a sample, <clears throat> and it looks at thousands and thousands of base pairs in the DNA, and then for each chromosome here, 1 through 20 plus the X chromosome, it tells you the log number, the expression of those. It gives you a picture of the DNA of that particular, that particular clone. So what? Well, here are two points sampled from the same clone. And what you ought to see is that they look pretty much the same. They've had similar amplification of 2, 7, and 10. They look very, very similar in their genetic profile, right? Here's another different clone. And again, you can see that here we've got 2, we've got 2, 7, 8, 10, 14, and 20. That's another clone, and two different points, and they look very similar, right? But the key point is, that's not the same as that. And it's a reasonable conjecture that that clone grew before that clone, because it became stronger, became overexpressed in an even more elaborate way. So in that way, we can begin to understand the amplification pattern for the two different spheroids, and we do that, and then we've linked that to the increasing DNA expression within these tumours. So what? Well, what RESIST does is it says disease progression is increased by at least 20% in the longest linear dimension. Right? And disease response is decreased by at least 30% in the longest linear dimension. So, otherwise the disease is considered to be stable. So that's the tumour, that's the original 9-month tumour shape, that's the 12-month tumour shape. Stable disease. Unequivocally, stable disease. Well, actually, let's look in a little bit more detail. And what we find is, by fitting this, that these two spheres have shrunk, but that one has grown very aggressively. So according to this model, this is evidence of very, very significant aggressive growth in a new sphero. This is a tumour which is really, really aggressively growing. Clinically, at the moment, everywhere in the world no, it's stable. It sure as hell is not stable. All right? Sure as hell is not stable disease. So, in conclusion, 
Medical image analysis involves very difficult image analysis problems, but doctors need numbers, they need error bars, they need results that enable them to do their jobs better. Doctors could not care less about mathematics or algorithms, just results. Models, 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 more models than a bloody Christian door fashion week, enable measurements in mammography, breast MRI, colorectal cancer, angiogenesis and clonal expansion of tumours. Some of those models are physics, some of those models are biology, some of those models are cellular pathways, some of those models are basically down at the level of DNA. They're all models. Models that enable us to connect what's happening genetically, epigenetically, through to the morphology, the phenotype of the tumour, right the way up to the images. That's what we need. But measurements can also be misleading. Right. Now, I hope, because the reason I'm here, I hope that at least one or two or three of you have been sufficiently interested in what I've been saying that you would want to learn a little bit more. So let me point to you at three books. The first one, and by a mile, the most masterful summary of cancer to date is Robert Weinberg's The Biology of Cancer. It's a great introduction, absolutely wonderful introduction. Um, you'd need to read it with somebody who understands biology. We did a reading group in our lab in which we had two biologists plus a bunch of engineers and we worked our way through the 700 and odd pages. That's just been updated last year. It's a truly wonderful book. But if you don't want to read that, then this, The Emperor of All Maladies, won the Pulitzer Prize. It's a popular book, it's a popular science book. It's the history of cancer. It was it's written uh, by um, Sadata Mukherjee. Absolutely beautiful, beautiful book to read. And then more recently, there's been a book by George Johnson, which is very well written, and this one, The Cancer Chronicles, is halfway between those two. It's, it's popular, but it's less... It's not quite as popular a count as that, but it doesn't have the deep biology of that. So, you've got a lot of things going to compete for your attention this week. My passion is cancer. Medical image analysis has made, is making, and will make in the future a phenomenal, phenomenal contribution to beating, to diagnosing, and monitoring the therapy of what is one of the most extraordinary diseases to afflict humidity. Humanity. I thank you for your attention.